in this lecture, I would like to talk about the developments which eventually led uh, to the development of science as we know it today. Modern science is a very special, relatively recent, and unique occurrence in human history. So we must ask the question, why science arose in our civilization and not in any of the great civilizations of history. The last two or three millennia have seen a dozen or so great civilizations with highly organized cities, well-developed political systems, great poetry and drama, but nothing at all like modern science. They seem to have all that was needed to develop a scientific understanding of the world, but they fail to do so. And if we look at these civilizations, we find highly developed technical skills in the working of stone, wood, and metal, great skill in making pottery and ceramics, but not a detailed understanding of the behavior of matter expressed in mathematical terms. Measurements were made to high accuracy both in the construction of buildings like the pyramids of Egypt and for surveying agricultural land. The motions of the stars and planets were, were recorded by the Babylonians, but there was no comprehensive understanding of the way these motions can be calculated by solving the equations of dynamics. The Greeks speculated about the ultimate constituents of matter, but they did not know whether they exist or if they do, what is their size and structure, or how they interact with each other, and how their properties can be related to those of everyday matter. Above all, there is no conception of the way all the infinite variety of phenomena, astronomical, electrical, dynamical, chemical, and atomic, can be understood as the manifestation of a unified structure that can be expressed in a very few differential equations. And this detailed understanding of nature that we call science, and, and we're calling, thinking now of modern science in the sense I've just mentioned, first came to maturity at a very definite point in human history, namely in Europe in the 17th century. It was primarily the achievement of Newton, who built on the work of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo, and showed how to combine the empiricism of Bacon and the rationalism of Descartes. Using and developing the concepts of space and time, mass and force, velocity and acceleration, momentum and energy, that had been gradually refined over the preceding centuries, he formulated the laws of motion and showed how these can be used to calculate both celestial and terrestrial motions, the orbit of the moon and the fall of an apple. To do this, Newton developed the differential calculus and showed how this powerful mathematical technique can be used to express his laws of motion in concise and elegant differential equations and then solve them to give a precise account of the observed motions. He thus laid the foundations of theoretical physics and the extraordinary growth of science since his time has been essentially a development and extension to other realms of phenomena of the method first due to him. Viewed in the context of the whole of human history, this is an extraordinary occurrence that makes our civilization unlike any other. For the first time, the world is unified by easy travel and communications, and man has a vision of the whole planet and of the relation of its parts. If this is so remarkable that we are forced to ask why all this started in Europe in the 17th century and why not in any of the great civilizations of antiquity? Why not in ancient China with its highly developed technology? Why not in India or Egypt, Babylon or Persia, Mexico or Peru? They seem to have all that is needed to develop a scientific understanding of the world, but they fail to do so. If the reason for this is not to be found in the material conditions of those civilizations, we must look for it in the realm of ideas. And this asked us, uh, leads us to ask why science did not develop in Greece, intellectually the most impressive of the ancient civilizations. 
The Greeks made such brilliant contributions to so many areas of thought and asked so many of the right questions about the world that we must ask why their science was in the end a failure. Partly this was because some of their ideas about the material world were in fact wrong and this inevitably prevented further progress. Another reason seems to be the failure of confidence, of the will to carry on in spite of any, every difficulty. And these two difficulties were eventually under, overcome from, humanly speaking, a rather unexpected quarter. Our attitude to the world, whether we are optimistic or pessimistic, whether we confidently believe that the material world is good and will yield its secrets to us, or whether we think that it is evil, inscrutable and unfathomable, whether we believe in progress, or whether we believe that all is determined by fate, all these attitudes are determined by our religion. So it was from religion that we received the ideas that eventually got the scientific enterprise going again. Early man personified natural forces. Woden and Thor are the gods of the storm. Woden of the wind and Thor of the thunder. We commemorate them still uh, on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Gods were thought to inhabit trees and stones and other natural objects. Ceremonies were held in sacred groves and men were sacrificed to the sacred oak in an attempt to influence natural forces. And within such systems of belief, science could not develop. In the East, there were great religions, Buddhism, Taoism and Hinduism, that still remain today. Two quotations will illustrate their attitude to the material world. The Eastern mystics are not interested in approximate or relative knowledge. They are concerned with absolute knowledge involving the understanding of the totality of life. Being well aware of the essential interrelationship of the universe, they realize that to explain something means ultimately to show how it is connected with everything else. As this is, is impossible, the Eastern mystics insist that no single phenomena can be explained. The Eastern mystics, therefore, are not generally interested in explaining things, but rather in obtaining a direct, non-intellectual experience of the unity of things. And this was the attitude of the Buddha, who answered all questions about life's meaning, the origin of the world, or the nature of nirvana, with a noble silence. And in this climate of belief, science couldn't develop. So we come back to this question of why science developed in our civilization and not in any of the other great civilizations of the past. And this is a complicated historical question that can be approached by listing the conditions that seem to be necessary for the rise of science and then seeing to what extent they are present in the different civilizations. If we find that the conditions necessary for the rise of science are present in only one civilization, then we have as full an explanation as it is possible to have for a historical phenomenon. We cannot, of course, expect to understand or explain the detailed history, for this depends on the presence of men of genius and other external circumstances. If we think about what is needed for the viable birth of science, we see, first of all, that it needs a fairly de well-developed society so that some of its members can spend most of their time just thinking about the world without the pre constant preoccupation of finding the next meal. It needs some simple technology so that the apparatus required for experiments can be constructed. There must be a system of writing so that the results can be recorded and sent to other scientists and a mathematical notation for expressing the results of measurements in numerical form. These may be called the material necessities of science, but since they may be found to a greater or lesser degree in most of the major civilizations of antiquity, we must look elsewhere for the answer to our question about the unique birth of science. If the answer doesn't lie in the material conditions, we must seek it in the realm of ideas. It is not possible, is it not possible that whether science develops or not depends on the attitude of the people to the material world? And we can imagine that certain attitudes 
would prevent anyone thinking about the world in a way likely to lead to a scientific understanding, while others might at least provide a fertile soil for its growth. The type of thinking carried out in the early stages of science is done by people who share the beliefs and ideas of their civilization. It is only later when science is well established that specialized languages and modes of thought grow up and are taught to students and young scientists. Now if we think about science and the attitudes that are likely to help its growth, we can see first of all that it is essential for people to be interested in the material world. And this implies that they must believe in some sense that it is good, so that it is worthwhile and respectable to try to find out more about it. Some people in history have thought that matter is evil and that we must have as little to do with it as possible. Some early mystery cults taught that the world is evil and transitory, so that perfection may be attained only by turning away from the things of this world towards eternal spiritual realms. And if you believe that, then there is no possibility at all that you will become a scientist. Another essential belief is that matter is orderly, that it behaves in a consistent and rational way. This means that if we observe and measure something one day, we will get the same results if we do the same thing on another day or at another place. If we didn't get the same results, if things behaved in a chaotic or random way, it would be impossible to build up a body of knowledge and science itself would be impossible. Unless we believe that there is an order in nature, then we will never take the trouble to find out what it is. Now concerning that order in nature, there are two possibilities. We may believe that the order in nature is a necessary order, that the material world could not be made in any way except the way that it is in fact made. Now if we believe this, then we might then think that the order of nature can be discovered by pure thought, that science can be developed in much the same way as mathematics, just by sitting in our study and thinking about it. Many people have indi indeed tried, tried to do this and it haven't got very far, and their speculations turn out in the end to be either trivial or wrong. We know that the only way to find out about the world is by controlled observation and experiment. And this is not encouraged if we believe that the order of the world is a necessary order. The other possibility is that the order of the world is one of many possible ones. In other words, we could assume that the order is contingent, that it, that it depends on something else, that it could be other than it is. And if we believe this, that the world is orderly, but it can be orderly in different ways, then the only way to ascertain that order is by observation and experiment. And thus the way is open for the development of science. Another requirement for the development of science is the belief that the whole enterprise is a practicable one. We must believe that the order in nature is in some degree open to the human mind and that if we try hard enough, we can discover some of its secrets. If the order in nature is hidden from the human mind, there is no way of discovering it, then there is no point in trying to find out about it. To sum up so far, we can see that by considering the nature of science, that it can grow in a civilization in which people believe that the world is good, or at least morally neutral, that it is rational and orderly, that it is contingent in the sense that it could be other than it is, and that it is apprehensible by the human mind. These beliefs are essential, but they are not enough on their own. Scientific research is difficult, and nature does not readily yield its secrets. So there needs to be a strong motivation to carry the scientist through all the failures and disappointments that ev inevitably come his way. Without this, we might never get down to work, even though we recognize the theoretical possibility of attaining some knowledge of the world. Another important characteristic of science is that it is a communal endeavor, the work of many minds. Every scientist builds on the work of his predecessors and shares the results with his colleagues. If scientists kept their results secret, the knowledge they gained would die with them and an extensive coherent body of knowledge would never be established. 
The scientist must therefore believe that whatever knowledge he or she gains is not his alone, but must be shared with the whole community. So these are the main beliefs which must be held by the whole civilization, everyone in it essentially, before science can even begin. They needn't be held consciously and explicitly in the sense that everyone could write them down in an orderly list. Many of them indeed are usually held unconsciously or implicitly. To us they are so obvious that we would never think uh, of formulating them. They are part of the very frag frag fabric of our thought and form the way we look at the world. And yet when we think about them in the context of the whole of human history, we realize that they constitute a very special uh, set of beliefs that is by no means universal. In fact, if we examine the beliefs of past civilizations, we find that many of them are quite different from those that we have seen are essential for the development of science. The very special set of beliefs about the material world that is needed for the growth of science did exist in Europe in the 17th century, and this is why science as we know it developed at that time. But what is the origin of those beliefs, and why were they present at that time? And to answer this question, we must go back to the beginnings of our civilization. And the beginnings of civilization are to be found in the Near East, in the fertile crescent stretching in a great arc from the Tigris and Euphrates to the Nile. It was dominated by the powerful civilizations of Egypt, Babylon and Assyria. The monuments remaining today fill us with awe, but they give us only a small indication of their power. In the midst of these powerful civilizations was a small and apparently insignificant tribe, the Israelites, with Jerusalem as their holy city. Humanly speaking, the Israelites were powerless against their great neighbors. Time and again, they were defeated and taken captive. They were exiled to Egypt around 1220 BC and eventually led out by Moses. Centuries later, their city was destroyed and they were dragged off again to captivity in Babylon. By the waters of Babylon, I sat down and wept when I remembered thee, O Sion. After 40 years, they returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt their temple, only to be conquered again and their temple once more destroyed. But what distinguished the Israelites from their powerful neighbors was their beliefs. The Babylonians bowed down to Marduk and the Egyptians worshiped Ammon. Complicated and confused creation myths with many gods fighting each other were developed to account for the origin of the world. In stark contrast, the Israelites affirmed their belief in one supreme transcendent personal God who made everything and who guides and governs our lives. Throughout their exiles, they remained faithful to their God and each time he brought them home. They did indeed have periods of decline when they built idols themselves, but eventually they repented and were forgiven. Throughout all their trials and tribulations, they kept their identity and their influences shaped the world where the power of Babylon, Egypt, and Assyria is but a memory. Their sacred books express their belief in a transcendent creator in matchless style. In his reply to Job, Yahweh asks, Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me, since you are so well informed. Who decided the dimensions of it? Do you know? Or who stretched the measuring line across it? The heroic mother of the seven martyred brothers in Maccabees likewise expressed this belief when she exhorted her last son to stand firm and willingly share the fate of his brothers. And she said, I implore you, my child, Observe heaven and earth, consider all that is in them, and acknowledge that God made them out of what did not exist, and that mankind comes into being in the same way. The book of Genesis bears witness to the same belief from its opening phrase 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In contrast to the confusing and complicated creation stories of surrounding civilizations, the creation story in Genesis has a clear logical structure expressed in poetic form. It clearly expresses belief in the absolute sovereignty, rationality and benevolence of God who brings all things into being by his command and communicates his own goodness to them. Although not expressed in modern language, it contain, contains essential beliefs about the world that must be held if science is to flourish. The earliest Psalms tell us how God made the world and prepared it for man. He sets the heavens, the moon and the stars in their places and makes man the ruler over his works. The heavens show, show forth not only his glory but also his lawfulness. The same law shows man the path to happiness and give him, gives him confidence about his place in the world. And this confidence is one of the bases of science. Yahweh is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Ah, how goodness and kindness pursue me every day of my life. My home, the house of Yahweh, as long as I live. So the whole world is the house of Yahweh. It is a good world where we can live in peace, providing that we keep God's commandments. Those are specified in Psalm 24, to avoid lies and not to pay homage to worthless things. The Israelites were secure in their beliefs, but were surrounded by unbelief. The Egyptians and Assyrians hoped to sway their idols by sacrifices, but the God of the Israelites was far above such things. When they fell into idolatry, they were recalled by Isaiah and by Jeremiah. The Israelites emerged from the Babylonian captivity with their faith stronger than ever. The Babylonian idols were ridiculed by Isaiah and the power of Yahweh described in a way that has no counterpart in any other ancient literature. When he wrote, Go up on a high mountain, joyful messenger to Zion. Shout with a loud voice, joyful messenger to Jerusalem. Shout without fear. Say to the towers of Judah, Here is your God. Here is the Lord Yahweh, coming with power, his arm subduing all things to him. Who was it who measured the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand, and calculated the dimensions of the heavens, gauged the whole earth to, to the bushel, weighed the mountains in scales, the hills in a balance? The first chapter of Genesis, despite its apparent simplicity, is highly structured to express very clearly the rationality of the universe and the absolute power of God who brings all things into existence simply by his command. His goodness is simply stated without any argument or justification. Man and only man is said to be made in the image of God whereas other creation stories show pantheistic tendencies. Man is given the mandate to multiply, fill the earth and conquer it, and to be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, and all living animals on the earth. Confidence in the goodness of creation shines forth from the Psalms. You visit the earth and water it, you load it with riches. God's rivers brim with water to provide the grain. And it is this same confidence that underlies the scientific endeavor. While we find in the Old Testament the essential truths about the relationship between God, man, and nature, it is a mistake to seek a close correspondence with the latest scientific results. St. Augustine remarked that the Bible teaches us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. We should therefore not expect the Bible to teach us any matters relating to science or to mathematics. There have been many attempts by concordists to relate the creation story in Genesis to what we know from science about the evolution of the universe. These are fundamentally misconceived and are liable to be made ridiculous by the advances of science. It is evidently not possible to analyze Genesis in a scientific satisfactory way as a temporal sequence, how, for example, can the planets exist 
uh, prior to the sun. The birth of Christ is universally recognized as a watershed in human history. Whatever one thinks of Christ, there is no denying that this poor carpenter from Nazareth, a small village in a minor province of the mighty Roman Empire, who formed a group of itinerant preachers and talked for a few years before being disgraced and killed, had more effect on history than any other man before or since. Whitehead, that is the philosopher Albert North Whitehead, has spoken of the two most momentous events in human history, the birth of science and the birth of a babe in Bethlehem, and he added that the connection between them is stronger than is generally realized. Christ was not concerned to teach science, but inherent in his teaching is a set of beliefs about the natural world that eventually led to the first viable birth of science in the High Middle Ages and to its subsequent flowering in the Renaissance. The foundations of these beliefs were revealed to the Israelites, in particular the, the belief in the rationality of the world which was ordered by its creator in measure, number and weight, which was the most frequently quoted biblical phrase in medieval times. The biblical teaching on creation was reinforced and extended by the teaching of Christ. The Christian belief concerning creation emphasizes not only that the universe was created by God out of nothing and in time, but also that the universe is totally dependent on God and totally distinct from God. The universe at any instant is sustained in being by God, and without this sustaining power it would immediately lapse into nothingness. In the early Christian centuries, there were passionate debates about the nature of Christ and heresies abounded. To define the true nature of Christ was the task of a series of councils of the church. And of these, the Council of Nicaea in 325 formulated the creed that is widely held today. And we are very familiar with these words, which we recite at Mass. Credo in unum Deum patrum omnipotentem Factorum celi et terre, visibilium omnium et invisibilium, et in unum dominum Jesum Christum filium Dei unigenitum, et ex patre nante ante omnia saecula, Deum de Deo, lumen de lumine, Deum verum de Deum vero, genitum non factum consubstantialem patri, perquem omnia facta sunt. It is easy to recite these hallowed phrases without fully realizing their impact, and still more their importance for science. The beginning of the Nicene Creed asserts the creation of the universe by God, factorum celi et terre, made heaven and earth. And one of the early heresies was pantheism, that failed to distinguish between God and his creation, holding that it is in some way a part uh, of God. In the Greco-Roman world, the universe was thought of as an emanation from a divine principle that was not distinguished from the universe. And pantheism is explicitly excluded by the Nicene Creed when it says that Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Christ is begotten, not made. Only Christ was begotten and thus shared in the substance of God. The universe was made, not begotten. Et in unum dominum Jesum Christum, filium Dei unigenitum, genitum non factum. Since pantheism was one of the beliefs preventing the rise of science in all ancient cultures, the Nicene creed prepared the way for the one viable birth of science in human history. Many ancient cosmologies held that the world is a battleground between the spirits of good and evil, and this dualism is inimical to science because it makes the world unpredictable, and dualism exclu is excluded by the Nicene Creed when it says that all creation takes place through Christ, perquem omnia facta sunt. Inherent in the Christian doctrine of creation is the belief that God freely chose to create the universe. He was not in any way constrained either to create or not to create it in the way that he did. It is therefore not a necessary universe in the sense that it had to be created or could not have been created otherwise. There is therefore no possibility of finding out about the universe by pure thought or by a priori reasoning. 
we can only hope to understand it by studying it and making experiments. Thus the Christian doctrine of creation encouraged the experimental method, which is essential for the development of science. All ancient cultures held a cyclic view of the world, and this was one of the beliefs that hindered the development of science. And this cyclic pessimism was decisively broken by belief in the unique incarnation of Christ. And therefore, thereafter, time and history became linear, with a beginning and an end. The theological di disputes of the early Christian centuries seem a long way away, but they were of dis decisive importance for subsequent history. Who has now heard of the Valencians, the Marcosians, the Nicolaitans, the Incretites, the Borbonians, the Ophites, or the Scythians, to list but a few? More have heard of the Arians, a heresy still prevalent today. Arius and his followers were prepared to accept monogenes, but consubstantial was unacceptable because it was not to be found in scripture. If the young deacon Athanasius had not prevailed against them, Christianity would have been destroyed. In his epistle to the Colossians, St. Paul says that in Christ all things took their being and were created through him and in him. He stressed Christ as the divine logos and the consequence that the creation must be fully logical and orderly. So all these beliefs that are essential for the development of science are found in Christianity, both in the Old Testament and in the Christological beliefs. During the early years of the church, there were few studies of the physical theory of nature. The physics of Aristotle received little attention and the prevailing view of the universe was that of Plato. Plato distinguished between the stable and eternal ideas that constitute the essential structure of a thing and the matter that together with the form constitutes the thing itself. The eternal ideas are produced by their numerical structure so mathematics is intimately related to all physical phenomena. Thus, for Plato, mathematics is essential for the study of nature. The early Christians, and especially the fathers of the Church, saw Plato's forms as eternal ideas in the mind of the Creator. Plato's cosmology was used by the fathers of the Church and later by Augustine in their commentaries on creation. Some of the works of the Greeks were translated by Boethius, who lived around 475 to 524, and in particular Euclid's Elements and Plato's Timaeus. But it was not until the 12th century that Aristotle's writings on science and scientific methodology became generally available in the West. Many early Christian thinkers studied the material world and wrote about it in the context of their beliefs. St. Augustine of Hippo, Hippo encouraged uh, the systematic study of the natural world, since he believed that its sacramental nature is symbolic of spiritual truths. He was a compulsive observer of a wide range of natural phenomena, always on the lookout for anything that gives even a fleeting glimpse of the reason that he believed lies behind all things. He was interested in nature primarily because it reveals God to the attentive observer and his philosophical reflections on the nature of time are still quoted as among the most profound ever written. The medievals were very interested following uh, uh, Augustine in finding these um, spiritual truths exemplified by the natural world. And one of the, one of the examples of this that I'm very familiar with is, is the arm, coat of arms of my own college in Oxford, the Corpus Christi College. And on that coat of arms you will find the pelican and the pelican is depicted uh, in her piety, uh, as the phrase goes, that is plucking her breast uh, to produce blood to feed to her chicks. And that is uh, uh, adopted as a symbol, as a reminder of the Eucharist, where Christ uh, gives his blood to us. So those um, symbols of the uh, an analogies between the natural world and spiritual truths were very much beloved by the medievals following, of course, uh, uh, Augustine. And that encouraged people to actually look at the material world and to study it attentively. In the early 6th century, John Philoponus, a Christian Platonist who lived in Alexandria, 
wrote extensively on the material world, showing the influence of Christian beliefs on those of the surrounding pagan world, particularly those derived from ancient Greece. He commented extensively on Aristotle, whom he greatly admired, but when the teaching of Aristotle was contrary to Christian belief, he did not hesitate to differ from it. And this was particularly important in his commentary on Aristotle's physics, when he said, contrary to Aristotle, that all bodies would fall in a vacuum at the same speed, irrespective of their weight, and that projectiles move through the air, not due to the motion of the air, but because they were initially given a certain quantity of motion. And this is a remarkable anticipation of ideas normally associated with Galileo, and shows a decisive break with Aristotelian physics. He was not the first writer in antiquity to break with Aristotle, but he did so more clearly and decisively. And the connection between his rejection of Aristotelian ideas and his Christian beliefs is to be found in the doctrine of creation. And addressing the question of motion, he asked, could not the sun, the moon, and the stars be not given by God, their creator, a certain kinetic force in the same way as heavy and light things were given their trend to move. He also believed that the stars are not made of the ether, uh, that is um, an incorruptible celestial matter, but of ordinary matter, thus rejecting Aristotle's distinction between the celestial matter, the incorruptible celestial matter, and corruptible terrestrial matter. So this shows very clearly that the Christian beliefs about the world are incompatible with the Aristotelian views on the divinity of celestial matter and the eternity of motion. It was thus inevitable that the spread of Christianity should lead eventually to the destruction of Aristotelian physics, thus opening the way to modern science. This is not to say, however, that Christian beliefs give any specific guidelines for the development of science. Nevertheless, the removal of obstacles is itself an indispensable service. Philoponus was also the first to say that Genesis was written for spiritual and not for scientific instruction, a wise statement that was too far in advance of his time to be congenial to contemporary theologians. And this theological boldness perhaps explains why Philoponus' ideas did not lead to further scientific developments. And his ideas on motion are remarkably similar to those of Buridan and Oreum in the High Middle Ages, which did succeed finally in initiating the scientific enterprise. To be fruitful, ideas have not only to be right, but they need to fall on fertile ground, and in this case a society sufficiently developed to make full use of them. And this was lacking for Philoponus, but it was not lacking in the High Middle Ages. There has been some speculation about whether the ideas of Philoponus were in fact known to Buridan, but nothing seems to be established definitely on this question. So now, with these developments uh, which, which show how Christianity gave the essential beliefs about the material world that provided the preconditions for science, and also the beliefs that gradually destroyed Aristotle's beliefs, which has uh, put physics in a straitjacket and prevented its development for 2,000 years, we are now on the threshold of the decisive breakthrough that led eventually to the rise of modern science. And that is what I would like to discuss in the next lecture.